Uh, we're going to continue in 2 Samuel uh, uh, this week as we're looking at uh, David's third lamb. We'll explain that uh, in a moment. Uh, but we want to understand uh, the vital importance of what this message uh, is intended to teach, why it's in the Bible. Uh, as we go through it, I think you're going to find it challenging uh, to our souls as we're pressing on to maturity, if the Lord permits. Uh, now that you're all rested and seated, uh, please stand up uh, so we can uh, read scripture together. We're going to be reading two slides. Don't backslide too soon. We're reading two slides out loud in unison. Here we go. The king charged Joab and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all the people heard when the king charged all the commanders concerning Absalom. The people of Israel were defeated before the servants of David. And the slaughter there was 20,000 men. Now Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. For Absalom was riding on his mule. And the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak. And his head got caught in the oak. So he was left hanging between heaven and earth while the mule was under him kept going. Then Joab took three spears in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. And ten men who carried Joab's armor gathered around and struck Absalom and killed him. Then the king said to Cushite messenger, Is it well with the young man Absalom? And the Cushite answered, let the enemies of my lord, the king, and all who rise up against you for evil be as that young man. The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And thus he said as he walked, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I have died instead of you? O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. O oh, Lord God, our hearts are breaking for those of us who have loved ones who don't know you. Uh, we pray that you would draw them to yourself. And we pray also you'll challenge our hearts with the vital importance of the good news. And so guide us as we study your word together. Uh, we pray that Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, uh, the very one who inspired scripture, uh, we pray that he would now illuminate our minds and our hearts to the truth of your word, and as we are yielded before Messiah, the living word of God, we pray Ruach HaKodesh would not only enlighten our minds, but empower us to live out the truth. For this we pray in Messiah's matchless name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Please be seated, if you will. And so as we consider this, uh, we're all hanging between heaven and earth. Uh, the Bible says that the soul that sins will die, uh, Ezekiel 18.4. And it also says that all have sinned, Romans 3.23. And so like Absalom, we're all awaiting a final verdict, uh, whether it's heaven's gracious desire for undeserved clemency or the earth's lawful desire uh, for a fully deserved condemnation. We're all hanging between heaven and earth, caught up in our pride like Absalom. And so we want to appreciate the story, the background to the story here. Uh, David had uh, cheated in, in uh, seducing or raping Bathsheba uh, and uh, then killing her husband to cover up the crime. Uh, Nathan had challenged him with a story of a rich man uh, who took his uh, rich shepherd who took his neighbor's one beloved sheep. Uh, and so David was quick to judge uh, that according to the law, David understood that the man must repay fourfold. Uh, and in fact, it turned out David was judging himself. Uh, but because of God's forgiveness, uh, David did not die for his egregious sins because he repented. But for the sake of God's reputation among the nations, the Lord severely chastened David that the sword, it said, will never leave his home 
and that four of his lambs, his sons, uh, would die. We're reading about Absalom, the third lamb. Uh, the Lord uh, uh, removed his restraint. How does God do these things? He re uh, right now, we may not understand it. As bad as society is, it's going to get worse. Uh, because in one, someday God's going to remove all the restraint of the Holy Spirit, the restrainer, uh, and let this world uh, do as it pleases, which is uh, horror upon horror. And so how does God bring that judgment? He, he removes his restraint upon those children and lets them do as they please. And so God's judgment would happen through their own evil and rebellious inclinations. If you want to see more on this, take a look at Romans chapter 1, 24 to 28. God gave them over. He removes restraint and gives you over to your desires. May God spare us accordingly. And so Absalom re rebelled against his dad, tried to take over the kingdom. Uh, the only thing that Absalom really needed now was to get rid of David, to kill him off. Uh, but in doing so, he was now living in denial of the promises of God that God made. We studied through 2 Samuel 7. We saw the promises that God made in the Davidic covenant that David, uh, amongst other things, would die peacefully uh, in his own home, etc. And, so, uh, and so what's going on here? Well, we're going to see that every hammer breaks against the anvil of God's word. Uh, you and my family, uh, me and my family, you and your family and friends, uh, we cannot succeed if we attempt to live contrary to the word of God. Many a hammer, many much arrogance has broken against that anvil. Well, on the other hand, God's word, I have it on the bottom right of the screen there from Jeremiah 23, 29. Uh, Jeremiah says, as he heard from God, is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks rock in pieces? And so God's word breaks every stony heart and shatters every iron will, uh, regardless of how strong-willed you may think you are. Absalom uh, rejecting David, and this is kind of uh, a picture of it. Let me just mention something. Let me get your attention, if I might. When we study through the Bible, uh, especially through the narrative portions of the Bible, the stories, when we read through the stories in the Bible, uh, we want to remember uh, that everything is based on the Torah of Moses, first of all, on the Torah of Moses. You say, well, I don't see any, uh, any verses from the Torah of Moses mentioned there. No, no. Uh, it's based on the Torah of Moses, but the narrative is the illustration of how those laws are worked out. And so the writer of uh, uh, 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Samuel, etc., expected that you knew the Torah of Moses and could read between the lines and understand what is going on. The second thing in interpreting the scripture is not only to understand the Torah of Moses as a backdrop, but to understand that Yeshua the Messiah is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13, 8. And so when we read through the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures as such, we want to understand it's all about Yeshua. You say, I don't see his name mentioned. Sometimes we see him in contradistinction, and sometimes we see him prefigured, uh, which would point us ahead to him. Uh, as we'll see in just a moment. But those two elements, remember those two things, the Torah of Moses into understanding the backdrop of what's playing out in the narratives and understanding Yeshua the Messiah as he is the centerpiece of all history and eternity, uh, yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, now as I was saying before I rudely interrupted myself, Absalom rejecting David, the true king of Israel, who goes and then weeps over Jerusalem, 2 Samuel 15, 30, foreshadows Israel 
rejecting the true son of David, Messiah, who also weeps over Jerusalem, if you can see the parallel uh, between those matters. Absalom rejecting uh, the true uh, king, David. Israel, national Israel, for the most part, other than for the remnant, rejecting the true king of kings, king of Israel, king of the Jews, Messiah, Yeshua, and both of them weep over Jerusalem for the same reasons. And so as God's promises assure David's eventual return to rule, so too God's word assures us uh, that Messiah, the son of David, will return to rule over Israel and the world. And all of God's people said, and come quickly. And so understanding Absalom's uh, and his larger army, vast larger army, had chased David and his thousands of faithful servants uh, out of Jerusalem to Machanaim in, the, in Gilead on the east side of the Jordan, uh, where the nation of Jordan is right now. And now's the time for the deciding battle, which we read about. Very, not much is said of it. It was a quick battle, uh, despite the overwhelming force David's army won. And so we want to understand here uh, that this battle was to determine who would rule Israel. Well, God's word is always true. And therefore, God's word uh, came to pass, and David, was the, David and his forces were a victor. Uh, with a victor. And so because of God's promises to David, uh, the outcome, of course, is certain. Uh, still, there is a question which we read about. If David is really going to forgive his son, Absalom, for this sinful rebellion. Uh, and so we want to understand this strange matter of, of the victory, but will he actually, actually forgive his son Absalom uh, for the horror that he caused in rebellion. Let's, let's learn further on about how a father's love is insufficient, is insufficient to save his sinful child or you. Well, as we get into the text, there's three points I want to mention. It's in your bulletin there if you want to take notes. First thing we'll take a look in regarding to Joab's justice and a father's love. The desire for leniency for a son, we can all understand that. We all identify with that. And then the demands of law over a sinner, we can kind of understand that that's how that rolls as well. Uh, and then the deficiency of love as a savior. What? I know, it's going to challenge some of your pre 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 preconceived notions here. But let's understand the text. First thing, desire for leniency for his son, as we had read, so David said, deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. Deal gently was in the imperative, a command, uh, not only for David's sake, but he gave it as king, was giving a command here. And so as we understand there, nothing in scripture grabs our fearful attention more than divine justice. Uh, which brings about the fear of death. You say, what do you mean? People fear death uh, because of condemnation they're going to face. They don't necessarily able to comprehend that perfectly or articulate that, uh, but in their spirit, they know they're in rebellion to God, and therefore there's a fear of death that all people have except believers in Messiah who uh, are removed from the fear of death altogether through Messiah's atonement. And so no one, we can understand, deserves divine judgment more than Absalom. <laughs> uh, no one was more than willing to carry out divine justice than Joab, his, David's chief general. Uh, Joab, who was a loyal to a fault, pragmatic thug. Uh, if you knew anything about Joab, to cross him was to die. Uh, he was a horrible person, uh, but useful uh, for, for, some, for some strange reason, as we understand these things. And so there is one who dreaded divine justice. Uh, no one dreaded divine justice more than David, who as king, he needed the rebellion to be destroyed. But on the other hand, he so wanted his rebel son to be spared. This is quite a conflict in the soul. 
Uh, and many of us who have children can understand this conflict of soul. How much we want the truth uh, to be uh, fully lived out and demonstrated. On the other hand, we all pray for some exceptions for family members and others accordingly. You say, do we? Oh, yes. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, a cult, because they deny the major teachings of the faith, uh, deny the deity of the Lord. It started, the Jehovah's Witnesses started uh, because uh, the person uh, who had started it, uh, his, his brother died, but his brother was unsaved. And he knew by what he was taught that his brother would go to hell. Well, he loved his brother so much, he said, well, that can't be right. And therefore, they started with that one false teaching that there is no hell, there is no eternal judgment. And with that, everything else fell apart for them as well. They started denying the proper teachings of Scripture altogether. Uh, so understand uh, the conflict that people face when you have loved ones uh, who are not believers uh, and who are uh, facing judgment accordingly. We understand that. And so nothing stirs the heart more than divine love, uh, especially when you know, it comes from a father's heart. You know, we, we love our children. I have two sons. We love them beyond words, uh, et cetera. Uh, we all would rather have the problems on us than on them, uh, et cetera. So that, we understand that. Uh, David wanted his son uh, to be spared, uh, spared from all that the Torah required. He, he understood the Torah, but he, he, despite what the Torah taught, he wanted his son to be spared. And he gave orders to that effect. Uh, but the love of a father uh, can conflict with the duty of a king. Can everyone understand that? Uh, I do remember planting a congregation uh, early on, back in the dark ages of congregation planting, way, way back in time now. I remember my little boy, Josh, sitting there, uh, a little boy, uh, I guess six or seven years old, and, and he kept talking out of turn during the service. And so I threw him out of the congregation, made him go to the nursery. <laughs> Every parent was chilled by that because if I would do that for my son, their children are in trouble deep. <laughs> and from then on, parents kept their kids close to them whenever I walked by. Uh, so understand, we understand the duty of a king, uh, et cetera, uh, but we also understand the love of a father and how there can be a lot of conflict accordingly. And so Joab leads uh, the army in battle against the army of Israel under Absalom. Uh, David had prayed, uh, of course, that Ahithophel, we saw last week, that his counsel would fail. Uh, and God answered that prayer wonderfully. Uh, David was so convinced that God would give the victory. He didn't even think about would there be a victory. He, only, he thought, yeah, but he thought it was necessary to tell his, his generals uh, to deal gently with Absalom. He was so sure there was going to be a victory that he thought he should tell his generals, uh, but be deal gently with Absalom. He didn't even bother saying, go get him. He knew that there would be a victory. He was so convinced of God's will of what God would bring about. And so Absalom is trying to destroy David and all of David's servants there. Uh, David only wants to secure the life of his rebellious son. Uh, I can only imagine that I have up on the screen there what Joab was probably thinking when he heard this, you know. We're going to war against the people who want to destroy us. Oh, and he wants to be gentle. He wants us to be gentle in the war. Can you wonder, what, is he king or is he kidding? How could such a thing possibly be? Uh, and so Joab, of course, probably rolled his eyes, moved on, just kill who's ever in my way, that kind of approach. And so David, uh, he, he knew that his sins, he felt terrible because he knew his sins had triggered all of this mess, uh, that this was, you know, uh, God's chasing upon his family. Uh, he's ready, therefore, to take responsibility for Absalom's uh, rebellion. What? He saw that this whole thing was somehow triggered by his own 
moral failures and all that came about. And so he want, he, he's willing to take responsibility for his son's evil behavior. Can you imagine that? Uh, Etc. And so David had repented and received mercy for his terrible sins and sought the same mercy for his wicked son. But would his son repent? That's the question. That was the question. Would his son repent? So let's, understand, let's get a little quick lesson from this. Uh, let me just, uh, just say right, out, what, uh, right out, out there, David was a horrible parent. Uh, when anything goes wrong, David was behind it. He was a terrible parent. Uh, as the Lord be pleased, and we'll see in the weeks ahead uh, how that worked out with other children. He was a terrible parent, too lenient, uh, did not in any way try to correct his children. Uh, there was nothing uh, about his parenting that anyone should model at all. Uh, but this is actually brings us to understand the lesson here regarding Absalom. Regardless of bad parenting or any other negative influences, everyone is responsible for their own misbehavior. Everyone is responsible for their own misbehavior. You say, well, what do you mean? I mean, there's going to be somebody who's going to say, well, uh, I was talking to someone just yesterday. Uh, who was trying to understand Hamas's side of the equation. Uh, that, you know, they had, uh, wasn't there some bad things done to them? That doesn't justify the evil that they perpetrated and continue to try uh, to bring about. Uh, you have to take responsibility for your own actions. You can't go blaming others for what was done to you, what you had to endure, what you had to go through, whatever it might be. And therefore, just because you were abused by your parent doesn't mean you get to abuse your children or your wife or your husband. No, this is wrong. You must take responsibility for your own actions. You say, but I'm saved. Not until you take responsibility for your own actions, recognize your sins, and trust them in the forgiveness and the mercy in Messiah's death. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But not until you repent. Not until you call it for what it is, a sin in the sight of God. No matter how much you justified it or anything else. You must take responsibility for your actions. And so in any case, uh, David... Uh, for David, the battle was a, a, a success. I, I really, I have that in quotes on the screen because in my mind, all I'm thinking about is 20,000 Israelis died. Uh, and if you call that a success, my heart is broken, as I'm sure everyone in Israel's heart was broken over these matters when they happen. And so uh, we see the army... Absalom's remaining group fleeing for their lives as they understandably should be doing. We come to the second point now. We understand not just the love of a father for a son, but the demands of law over a sinner. And so we see how Absalom was caught by his luxurious hair in the, tree, in the oak tree there and uh, was killed accordingly by Joab as, and his men. And so he was destined to die. Uh, we had seen last week, uh, if you were here with us in our study, how God had orchestrated things so that uh, Absalom would follow a, a bad plan uh, from uh, his point, it would turn out for him, but God, from God's point of view, God brought it about accordingly. And so riding on his mule, you say, a mule? A mule? Yeah, uh, they had mules. Uh, there were times when they had horses, uh, but nonetheless, the king had his own mule. And when Solomon will, may see this uh, in weeks ahead, uh, when Solomon was uh, or, uh, or, uh, anointed as king, he, David had him ride on David's mule, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, even though we think of horses, uh, most of the nations had horses. Israel had lots of mules. Uh, I suppose, of course, we're, we can be stubborn as a... So, anyway. And so he's riding along there, 
And Absalom was well known for his hair. I, I am well known for my hairs. You see the difference? Uh, he had hair, I have hairs. He was well known for his luxurious head of hair. Uh, and riding along, his hair gets caught in the branches. Can you imagine the picture there? What he prided himself in was going to be his undoing. Uh, you know, uh, pride cometh before a fall, uh, etc. So take heed for those who still have hair, I'm just saying. Uh, nonetheless, uh, he shamefully hangs there, awaiting his doom, unable to disentangle himself. You can imagine what he's going through, or to help himself. Uh, this is God's will, uh, whom he had rebelliously mocked. God is now bringing a judgment through this indig indignity. And so we realize when we study through the text, we see that uh, the Bible records no prayer, no repentance, no pleas for mercy. He just kept trying to save himself. Kept trying to save himself. Kept trying to disentangle himself from the mess he got himself into. Couldn't blame the mule. I mean, that's what people end up doing, but you can't do it. It's your mule. Uh, you need to redirect your mule. But nonetheless, all he kept doing, trying to save himself, and want to ask you a question, is this what you're doing? In, in your life, are you just trying to disentangle yourself, you know, and trying to keep yourself from any kind of judgment, any kind of chastening uh, that the law may require? Uh, you lie, you cheat, uh, et cetera, in order to kind of cover up. You try to disentangle yourself from one problem. You say, what do you mean? You're not reaching out to God. You're not trusting the Lord. You're not repenting of your sins. You're using one sin to cover up for another sin. You're trying to disentangle yourself, trying to cover up, free yourself, save yourself, and it cannot be done. It could not be done by Absalom. It can't be done by you. And so do not be deceived. God is not mocked. What a person sows, this also will he reap. What you sow is what you reap. And so, as the Bible says in Deuteronomy, it's up on the screen, curses is the one who hangs on a tree. And we'll see how Messiah became our curse for us. And so, uh, not only was he destined to die, he deserved to die. And we see here, I have on, your screen, on the screen on the left side, Scripture. Uh, uh, he dishonored his doting father. Uh, his father was overly kind to him. Uh, but nonetheless, he tried to make himself odious to his father. He denied God's true king and plan for Israel, as we had mentioned before. In 2 Samuel 5.12 as well, it said Hashem had established David as king for the sake of his people, Israel. Uh, we had studied that a while back, but nonetheless, it is true. Uh, and so he denied God's true king and God's plan for Israel. And thirdly, he despised God's eternal word. Uh, Deuteronomy 27.16 says, Cursed is he who dishonors his father or his mother. You say, well, my parents are gone. Well, mine too. But in your heart, you say, well, you don't know what my father said to me. You don't know what my mother... In your heart, have you forgiven them by the blood of Yeshua? Are you honoring them or continuing to dishonor them because, like Absalom, you had this perceived perspective that you have somehow been wrong uh, beyond forgiveness or something like that? No, no, no. Beware, brothers and sisters. There is no condemnation to those in Messiah Yeshua, but there is chastening. There is chastening uh, in Messiah Yeshua. So repent of your sins, for your sin shall find you out. And so that being said, not only was he destined to sin and deserve, uh, destined to die and deserved to die, but he was doomed to die. And so though David had requested mercy, uh, Joab cold-bloodedly executes Absalom, despite the pleas from his dad to Joab, justice must be served against such a murderous rebel. Why? Because let alive, like Hamas, let alive he might still regather his army and try to kill David. 
and you know of what I speak. If Hamas is allowed to continue, they'll just regather and continue to try to destroy Israel and every Jewish person from the river to the sea. And so understand, in some cases, it's God's will that justice must be done accordingly. And if there is repentance, and we pray for it, we, God does not desire the death of the wicked, and neither do we. But if there is no repentance, there is nothing but justice to bear on these matters accordingly. And so though it disobeys David, his strategically, legally, and reasonably, Absalom must die. And that's what we see here. And because of our sins, we're all hanging between heaven and earth. We all deserve to die. The soul who sins uh, will die. Let me ask a question here. How many people in this room will just acknowledge the fact that they have sinned? Raise your hand. Take a look around. You're in the right group. I just want to say you're with a group of all forgiven sinners. Sinners, but forgiven sinners. But understand, we're all between heaven and earth accordingly. We all deserve to die because the soul who sins will die. And so heaven so desires our fellowship despite our sins. Earth so desires our judgment because of our sins. And though the Father loves everyone, the law must be enforced. Though Lord God loves everybody, for God so loved the earth, the world. What? Yes. But still, his word is true. Justice must be done. There will be judgment on those who refuse to repent and believe in the Messiah. And so, therefore, sin must be judged. And so, therefore, the sinner must die. And so now we come to the third point as we conclude here. The deficiency of love as a savior. You see what David had cried out for learning of his son's death. Would I had died instead of you, O Absalom, my son, my son. Heartbreaking. Absolutely heartbreaking. But nonetheless, we see that love is not enough. And so David's grief, profound, poignant, pitiful, actually. When David hears of Absalom's death, he's it says, deeply moved. We understand that, and we wept. David loved Absalom with a father's inseparable love. This phrase, deeply moved, is something we all experience. We all understand that. We understand what that's like. Yeshua felt that same way. It's used, same phrase is used twice. When at the death, uh, at the burial uh, of, uh, of Lazarus, at the funeral of Lazarus, uh, he, at the gravesite of Lazarus there, he was moved, uh, deeply moved as well. Why? Because Yeshua was upset over the deadly horrors that sin causes. Sin causes death. And his heart was broken along with ours as we see all these things. And that's why the Messiah, the Son of David, and the Son of God came into the world to die for sins. God's heart is broken. God's heart is broken over the damage we cause ourselves by our own actions and attitudes by the horrors we bring upon ourselves because of our lies, our cheating, whatever else it may be. And so God's heart is broken, and that's why Messiah came in the flesh. We understand this love of God. And so unlike David's response to the baby's death, which we saw in 2 Samuel 12, 23, with the baby's death, he was assured he'd see his son again. But it's different here. Absalom is not an innocent little baby. Nor was he a repentant, so David had no hope whatsoever to see his son again. There's a gulf which neither he can cross nor we can cross. Luke chapter 16. And so for the same promise of eternal life to all who repent by trusting in Messiah's sacrifice, there's also the very same truth that only eternal judgment uh, is there for those who will not repent, who die in unbelief. And therefore, that's what makes us so urgent. We're deeply moved. That's why we want to proclaim good news. We understand what, what's up ahead there. That's why we've come to faith in Messiah. And regarding that matter, isn't it better to be warned to five years too soon than five minutes too late? So we warn everyone that they need to trust in Messiah now while it can still be called now. Now is the day 
uh, of repentance, the day of salvation. And so as I have on the right side of the screen, people on earth hate to hear the word repent. Those in hell wish they could hear it just one more time. But in vain. Right now is the opportunity. And those who truly love the wayward, as we all do, can understand the father's love for a prodigal child. Moses wanted to be blotted out in Israel's place uh, in, uh, in Shemot 32, 32. Uh, Paul wanted to be damned in the place of his brethren Israel according to the flesh. But in every case, their love, like David's love, was insufficient uh, for those that they loved. Insufficient to save those they loved. By itself, listen very carefully. The love of God, the love of our Heavenly Father, is insufficient for lost people. You say, I don't understand. How could that be? Understand with me, when David cries out, would I have died instead of you? David's death couldn't pay for his, sins, his son's sins any more than he could pay for his own sins. Yes, God is holy, and because God is also love, that is why God came in the flesh, because his heart was broken over us. And therefore, not just his love, but there had to be that sacrifice. The eternal sacrifice had to be made for sins. Messiah's death instead of you. David said, I wish I had died instead of you. It's Messiah's death instead of you. Took your place. He took your sins because of the broken heart of God. And if your heart is broken, you need to pray people will trust in Messiah's death because love is not enough. There needed to be the payment for sins as well. And so the Heavenly Father desires, I have on the right side of the screen there from 2 Peter 3, 9, Adonai is not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. But he gave us a free will to make choices. Usually they're bad choices. But right now I'm asking you to trust in the Lord. Trust in Messiah. Place the simplest faith you got in what he has done for you. Because even though he doesn't want anyone to perish, the catch is that it has to be that all should repent. They need to repent. Because he's a holy God, there must be repentance where the sinner trusts in Yeshua's sacrifice. For God the Father gave his only begotten Son to do what this David desired but could not do, to die in his son's place, Yeshua in our place. And so there is a Savior who, because he has dealt gently, uh, who, because he has dealt perfectly, rather, uh, with the horror of sin by dying in our place, can now gently deal with all sinners who come to him. He is not going to judge you. He's not going to condemn you. He took condemnation on himself so he can deal gently with you if you but trust in him and who he is. And so the scripture says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But it goes on to say that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. Understand, there had to be the provision that needs to be the repentance. There had to be the provision that has to be faith in the provision God has made. Though the Father loves you, you must believe in his Son. And therefore, our hearts are moved. Therefore, we share the good news with all with ears to hear, even now. Let's pray together. As we bow our hearts before God, our hearts are broken. As we understand, we are Absalom. We are hanging by a thread between heaven and earth. But your grace is our sufficiency. Your grace is our sufficiency. We thank you for the sacrifice of Messiah. It is ever our good, now and forever. And but Lord, move us to share it with others. And Lord, if there's anyone here, anyone live streaming with us, anyone somewhere in this building who understands their need for him, understands they have not yet trusted in the death of Yeshua for their sins, draw that one to yourself, that they might have forgiveness and new life 
as they turn from their sins and trust in the Savior, as they trust in the Messiah and his sacrifice for their sins. And even now as we close in prayer, if your heart needs to trust the Messiah, pray with me right now. A simple prayer, not that the prayer could ever save you, no, but it'll bring your faith to trust in Messiah. Faith in Yeshua is the key in your heart. Pray with me the simple prayer. Dear God, forgive me for my pride. Forgive me for my selfishness. Forgive me for all my sins through the atonement of Messiah, through the sacrifice of Yeshua. And in his name, we pray. And if you prayed that prayer, though everyone else's eyes are closed in prayer, I want to pray for you. If you're here in the sanctuary, if you prayed that prayer right where you are, just raise your hand so I can pray for you. God may confirm it to your soul as well, right where you're seated. Just raise your hand right where you are. If you pray that prayer, right where you are. Father, even now we thank you for the full sufficiency of the sacrifice of Yeshua. Now we pray the love of Messiah might constrain our hearts and we might be your instruments of good news, both here and around the world. For all this we give thanks for in Yeshua's name, and all of God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen.